All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to CEC. It is 3 past 11. So let's get in here and we can start worshiping our Lord together. Make your way in. We have uh, more time to fellowship after the service. Also, certainly welcome to join us for lunch. We can talk some more. All right, come on in. Let's prep our hearts for worship and praise. And when you're ready, please stand and join us.
we do believe that. We do that you I believe that you are more than able. God, I thank you. I thank you for the privilege of these brothers and sisters, Lord, these seekers and young believers, Lord, all gathering together. Lord, we want to know you. Lord, we want to see you. God, help our faith to grow. Help us to believe that you are more than able. God, I pray that you would go before this time, Lord, that we would honor you with our hearts and our minds, Lord. Uh, God, would you just bring the distractions that are just so heavy on us? Some of us come in with really heavy burdens. God, would you just uh, allow us to lay those at your feet? I pray that you would be glorified today through this service, glorified through this worship of you. And it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen. I invite you to say the Apostles' Creed with us. Are you ready? I believe in God. Father Almighty. Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We are glad that you guys are here today. I'm just going to go through a few announcements for us and then let you have some fellowship time. Actually, I, I'm sorry, I'm mistaken. It is the first Sunday of the month. We are not having fellowship time, but we'll dismiss the kids. At this time, so you can head downstairs, guys. Have a great time. And uh, this Friday, there's youth group. There's no youth group. There's no meeting. You guys can read better than I can. So here we go. Uh, Friday, there's no youth meeting this week. Uh, but there is the high school tr retreat coming up. So the deadline is coming very quickly. So if you're interested or you think you may be interested and a youth leader can convince you, please talk to them so they can convince you. Uh, I wanted to invite every lady that has not signed up already. Uh, maybe you haven't heard much about this, but there is a women's conference that uh, we would love for you to come to with us. Um, so you can go ahead and sign up for that if you're interested. If you have any questions, please come see me. Um, and we would just love to have every lady that is available from our English ministry join us there. We went last year. It was a really encouraging time. It was a really wonderful fellowship and amazing speakers. So I think you will be uh, abundantly blessed. So please consider coming. And if you have questions, again, I'm the, the person to chat with. And we're good. All right. I'm going to introduce, I think, the best man in the world. But it's my husband. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sonia and worship team. Appreciate that. Uh, open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. So, uh, could somebody look in the, uh, the black pew Bibles and tell me what page number it is? Um, just holler it out when you're there. 966. 966. Okay, so if you're using one of the Bibles that are scattered throughout the room, it's page 966, or you can use your own Bible or a Bible app. Uh, I have one more announcement that I want to make before I preach today, and that's next Sunday, uh, we're going to be doing something special at the conclusion of our service. As you might know, uh, we have been moving towards uh, in, uh, appointing elders uh, for our church, and we voted three men in as elders, and so uh, hoo -hoo, they, they, they all passed the vote, and next Sunday, at the end of our service, uh, around 12:15, we're all going to go downstairs. If you're able to stay, we'd we'd really love for you to to join us. We're going to go downstairs and merge our service with the uh, Chinese congregation service. And Pastor Ken and I will be laying hands on the three uh, men that we have voted in as elders, and we will be officially appointing them as elders uh, for our church. It'll be about a 15 minute or so. Um, uh, ceremony. So just wanted to let you know about that. So next week I'm going to have to make sure I don't preach too long because we've got to go downstairs and, uh, and merge our services and do that. All right, so we're in week two of our sermon series called Blueprint, where we're exploring 
the book of Acts uh, and using it sort of as a blueprint for our church, trying to figure out how do we build upon the last 50 years of gospel ministry here uh, at CEC. And when we try to do something like that, it's easy to think about tradition. It's easy to think about the way we have always done things. But the most important um, uh, sort of litmus test in any church, in any era, is what does the Bible say? Specifically, how does the New Testament say that churches ought to be structured and churches ought to be run? And what does the New Testament say a church is even for? So we're reading this old, old blueprint, 2,000 years old, uh, to figure out how we can answer those questions. I'm going to read from uh, Acts chapter 1, beginning at verse 12, and I'm going to read to the end of the chapter. It says, Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they arrived, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. They all were continually united in prayer along with the women, including Mary the mother of Jesus and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers and sisters. The number of people who were together was about 120 and said, Brothers and sisters, it was necessary that the scriptures be fulfilled that the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of David, foretold about Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus, for he was one of our number and shared in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with his unrighteous wages. He fell head first, his body burst open, and his intestines spilled out. This became known to all the residents of Jerusalem, so that in their own language, that field is called Hakeldama, that is field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his dwelling become desolate, let no one live in it, and let someone else take his position. Therefore, from among the men who have accompanied us during the whole time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day he was taken up from us, from among these it is necessary that one become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they proposed two. Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, You, Lord, know everyone's hearts. Show which of these two you have chosen to take the place in this apostolic ministry that Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots for them, and the lot fell to Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we desperately need your help. And I ask that through the explanation of your word, we would see your son in all of his glory and that we would become more like him through the power of the Holy Spirit. In your name we pray, amen. You know, blueprints don't have to start on a computer with sophisticated equipment. They can oftentimes just start on the back of a napkin. In fact, that's how the Space Needle got its start. A hotel executive first doodled on the back of a napkin, and over the course of two years, that grew into the designs that would become as complex as Seattle's Space Needle. When our family visited Seattle and went to the top of the Space Needle last year, one of the things that struck me the most as we were reading the historical sections that talked about how the Space Needle was constructed was how many different people were involved in the design and the construction of the Space Needle. In particular, what struck me, the, the one data point that jumped out to me was 467 cement trucks, all doing one continuous pour. At that time, it was the longest continuous cement pour in the West. And they had to do it all at the same time because of the way that they were trying to uh, construct and lay the foundation for the Space Needle. A lot of people were involved in the construction and the design of the Space Needle. Imagine if you were one of those 467 cement truck operators and you get to tell your kids and your grandkids 
that I was there on the day that we started building the Space Needle. I was operating one of those 467 cement trucks. That'd be kind of a cool factoid to pass along to your family. Of course, it wasn't just those guys running the cement trucks. There were countless others, hundreds, probably thousands of people who were involved in the design and then the implementation of the design. None of those folks accomplished the mission by themselves. None of the cement truck operators implemented the design by themselves. It required 467 of them quite a team. And every good design, even if it's a great design, will fall to pieces if there's not a good team willing to implement the plan. A blueprint is great on paper, but if it's not actually followed, if there's not a group of people that bands together and says, I will follow this blueprint to build this house or this program or this bridge or whatever it is that we're designing if the team doesn't come together to implement the blueprint it doesn't really matter how good the blueprint is the space needle still stands as a symbol of seattle because a team of thousands of people decided that they would all play their part in executing the plan the text before us this second section of the book of acts shows us the importance of God's team in accomplishing God's mission. The whole book of Acts is a blueprint designed to show us how we are to function as a church. And these verses right here show us the importance of this diverse group of Christians, this first band of brothers and sisters who were trying to figure it out, but determined to follow Jesus no matter what the cost. You might have noticed that there was a whole lot of names in this passage. Some names that we're more familiar with and other names that we're, we've never maybe heard of before. We're going to talk a little bit about those names today. We're going to explore what we know about some of these individuals and then figure out what we can learn from them as we together seek to implement God's blueprint for our church. The disciples gather in this upper room because Jesus had told them that in a few days, the Holy Spirit will come. So they, they live in a, a unique moment in history. We talk about the Holy Spirit as if he's here and he is. But back then, he wasn't, at least not like he was about to be on the day of Pentecost. When we turn the page and get to chapter 2, which we'll do that next week, we're going to see that the Holy Spirit comes in a fresh new way. He was always there, of course, because he's God, but he was going to come in a fresh new way on the day of Pentecost, but that hasn't happened yet. And what we read last week was that Jesus ascended back to heaven and he said, wait in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit who's coming in a few days. So then this passage right here is sandwiched between the departure of Jesus and and the arrival of the Holy Spirit. It's those few days of waiting. And they gather in this upper room, probably the same upper room where they observed uh, the Last Supper, the first communion. And they gathered in this upper room and they're waiting and they're praying. And then the text begins to tell us some of the folks who were in that room. The first one listed is Peter. Simon Peter, one of the most famous of the disciples. If you are familiar with the Christian story, you have at least heard of Peter. He's the guy who some of the Bible is named after. He's got two letters that he wrote to some churches uh, in Rome, and uh, we see his name on those letters. But he didn't get his start as a famous apostle writing part of the New Testament. He was just a regular fisherman working the Sea of Galilee, probably six days a week. He would take off on the Sabbath, uh, but the other six days a week, he's probably out in his boat with his brother Andrew fishing. They didn't fish back then with a, with a, a pole and a line, but they would let down these, uh, these great big nets into the water and then pull them up, see how many fish they caught. 
and then row the boat over here and then drop the net down over here and pull it up, see how many fish we caught. You do that for six days a week. That's really hard, backbreaking work. It wasn't glorious, but it was what Peter did to provide for his family. The Bible doesn't say anything about kids, but we at least know he was married, and so he is providing for his wife. He's working hard with probably not a whole lot of education, very blue-collar kind of guy, a fisherman on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus, the Bible tells us in the four Gospels, that Jesus looks at Peter and says, follow me. And Peter did. Peter left his nets. He left his family fishing business and followed Jesus. Alongside his brother Andrew, Andrew had been a, a disciple of John the Baptist, the cousin of Jesus. And Andrew is listed in this text as also being in the upper room. He's been on this journey for a long time, even longer than Simon Peter. Because Simon Peter wasn't really a follower of John the Baptist like Andrew was. So Andrew's been at this just a little bit longer. But Andrew doesn't come from this glorious uh, pedigree. He hasn't been to all the right schools where he has learned all of the right stuff and has this really impressive resume. He's just a humble fisherman who hears John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness, announcing the kingdom of God, and Andrew finds that strangely compelling. And then he hears when John the Baptist points at Jesus and says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Andrew begins to follow Jesus. So he's been at this now for just over three years. Simon Peter and Andrew are in the upper room, but so are another couple of fishermen, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, or as Jesus nicknamed them, the sons of thunder, because they had this impetuous, judgmental spirit ready to call down lightning on their opponents. Have you ever felt that way? Want God to squash that coworker that you don't like? Or that driver that just cut you off? No, no one's admitting to that. You're all like, what? Who, me? No, I never do that. Come on. We know better. The sons of thunder, James and John, they also don't, don't come from this, this background that many of us would have expected. We would expect that the Messiah of Israel, the king of Israel, would gather an elite band of warriors around him. People who had the, the best military training. People who came from wealthy families who could support the Messiah's campaign. And people who had an elite education. The smartest people. The people who understood the law of God. And Jesus starts with four fishermen. Now James and John have a special honor in that they are included in the, uh, the inner circle of Jesus, if you will. If you read the four Gospels, you see that he had these 12 guys that followed him around everywhere, the 12 disciples. But oftentimes, Jesus would go off and bring three guys with him. Those three were Peter, James, and John. I don't know why he did that. I don't know if they were better friends or he saw the leadership potential in them and wanted to invest in them. I'm not sure. But he, he goes off repeatedly with Peter, James, and John. And then John is even further in the inner circle because he's described as the beloved apostle, the one whom Jesus loves. John is Jesus' best friend. That's why when Jesus is on the cross, and as any good Jewish young man would do, when facing death, he arranges for the care of his mother. Joseph is long since dead, apparently. And Mary depends upon her son for her financial well-being. And Jesus is about to die. So he passes the responsibility to John, his best friend. John, would you look after my mother? He's showing familial piety and honor to care for her. But the person he turns to is the one person on earth that he's closest to, his best friend, the Apostle John. 
Philip is also listed in the upper room. We pretty much know nothing about Philip other than what it says in the, in the Gospels. We don't know his background. We don't know where he came from. N the next guy in the list is Bartholomew, who's also called Nathaniel. Again, we don't know much about him except for one interesting factoid. He was prejudiced. When uh, he meets Jesus, he says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Jesus is from Nazareth. You know how those people are in Nazareth. You know, what kind of, you know what kind of people are up there. Are we sure this is the king? Are we sure this is the Messiah? This would be like us here in the nicer, quieter, safer suburbs saying, can anything good come from downtown? Or to put a little finer point on it, there's a preacher who's doing miracles by the side of the road, and we find out that he lives in the tent camp. And we say, that doesn't make any sense. How could someone like that come from there? Before you, before you judge Nathaniel, you might want to look in the mirror at our own hearts. Nathaniel says, can anything good come from Nazareth? Now, he got over his prejudice because he followed Jesus. He decided that the man from Nazareth was worth following, and that's basically all we know about him. The next guy who's listed as being in the upper room is Thomas. We know two things about Thomas. He was a twin, and he famously doubted Jesus. A couple of different times, we see his skepticism at play. One time, Jesus says, uh, it's time to go to Jerusalem because Lazarus has, has passed away, and Jesus wants to go. And, of course, Jesus is going to raise Lazarus from the dead. But Thomas doesn't know that. And Thomas says, okay, fine, let's all go to Jerusalem and die with Jesus. He has this very grim, pessimistic outlook. He struggles to articulate his faith. We see that most clearly after Easter, when Jesus begins to appear to the various disciples. And he appears to some of the disciples, and Thomas is out. Maybe he's, he's going to the store or something. I don't know where he was, but he comes back, and the disciples say, we saw Jesus. He's alive. Do you remember what Thomas said? Until I see him and touch the scars in his hands and see the wound in his side, I will not believe. Interestingly, Jesus accommodates Thomas. Jesus could have said, I'm not going to show you my scars, Thomas. I want you to just overcome your doubt on your own. Just figure it out. But Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus has mercy and grace and compassion on those who doubt, those who struggle with their belief, which is people like us. Or like the person who came to Jesus in the four Gospels and said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. You see, belief and unbelief can coexist in the same human heart, and they did for Thomas. And Thomas does believe when he sees the scars in Jesus' hands and the gaping wound in his side. Thomas believes, and Jesus includes him into his community. Some of us think that in order to belong to the church, we have to have everything figured out. We have to understand everything from A to Z, but that, that misses the point of faith. We come to God with simple, childlike faith that says, I believe, I see the scars, and I'm holding on. And in reality, it's not so much us holding on to God, but God holding on to us. That's the gospel story. That's the gospel message. Now, if I were trying to start a movement, I might have not picked Thomas. In fact, I probably wouldn't have picked Thomas. I would have wanted people of stronger faith. People who never doubted. People who, when they heard other people's doubts, could whip out the best arguments, the most compelling evidences. Thomas, to me, seems like kind of a, a weak foundation to start your church on. And that's exactly who Jesus chooses. And I think that's who Jesus is still choosing. Real people like us who struggle. But keep on coming back. Keep on showing up every Sunday and we say, Lord, we believe. Help our unbelief. The next person that's listed in the upper room is Matthew. 
Matthew is a tax collector. Now, he's not like an IRS agent. Tax collectors in the ancient world were a lot different. They were collaborators with the Roman Empire. Jewish men who had been hired to collect taxes for Caesar. So the Roman Empire had, had uh, conquered Israel, and the Jewish people hated Rome. They hated the Roman soldiers who were garrisoned all throughout the country. They were essentially the, the police force of the Roman Empire. And these guys were not gentle, they were not kind, and they didn't follow any laws. They just did what they wanted. And Caesar had decreed that there would be a certain tax collected. And so they would hire these local Jewish guys, people who knew the towns and villages really well, knew everybody really well, so that they could collect these taxes for them. And Caesar would look at the tax collector and say, here's the tax, here's the tax I want. You can charge whatever you want above that for your finder's fee. So tax collectors got wealthy on the backs of their brothers and sisters. They squeezed every last possible dollar out of their neighbors. And so tax collectors were a despised class of people. They were essentially thieves. But not just thieves, they were, they were traitors. They had betrayed what it meant to be Jewish. If you were Jewish, you believed that there was one God and his name was Yahweh. <laughs> but the Romans said that Caesar was Lord. That was blasphemy. That was idolatry. Caesar was an imposter sitting on the throne. And here was Matthew, this Jewish boy who ought to have known better, who was collaborating with a false god, giving money, tax money, hard-earned money from his Jewish brothers and sisters, taking it from them, throwing them in prison if they didn't comply, and then giving it to the one who said that he was Lord of all the earth. Tax collectors were pretty much the least popular people in Israel. The Bible says in the Gospels that Jesus was walking by Matthew's tax collector booth, and he saw him hard at work stealing people's money, and he looked at him and he said, follow me. Interestingly, he didn't say, Matthew, I want you to get everything in order in your life. I want you to fix your life first and then follow me. You see, if that were the message, that, would be a, a, that wouldn't be really good news because people like Matthew, people like us have been trying to fix our lives on our own for a very long time and we're really good at failing because we don't have what it takes to, to reform on our own efforts. We don't have what it takes to fix ourselves. The whole point of the gospel is that Jesus came because we could not save ourselves. And God takes the initiative to come to Matthew's tax collector booth and say, follow me. It's a divine summons. And Matthew answers the call. He probably is not even sure who it is he's following. But there was something about that voice Something about the command that was irresistible. And Matthew begins to follow Jesus. James, the son of Alphaeus, is mentioned in the text. There's two different James that are disciples of Jesus. Sometimes that gets confusing. James, the son of Alphaeus, we know very little about him. Then there's Thaddeus, also called Judas, different from Judas Iscariot. And then there's Simon the Zealot. Simon the Zealot, right alongside the tax collector Matthew in the upper room. I would have loved to be a fly on the wall during all the different times they hung out because Simon is a zealot. The zealots were a terrorist group in ancient Israel who believed that because Rome was so evil, assassinations we're okay because Rome worshiped a false god it was okay to take out Roman leaders take out Jewish collaborators Matthew the tax collector would have been a kind of guy that Simon the zealot 
would have trained to murder. It's kind of like a it's kind of like a gangbanger, except viewing themselves as like righteous, doing righteous violence, telling themselves they're on God's side. They're trying to save Israel. And so Jesus finds Simon the Zealot. We don't exactly know all the circumstances. And he calls him to join his company. Calls him to join his band of disciples. Simon the Zealot, the the terrorist, side by side with Matthew, the tax collector. Jesus always chooses the people that seem least likely to be the ones to change the world. Which is encouraging. When you look in the mirror and you think, what do I have to offer Jesus? What do I have to offer this movement of Christians? We realize when we say that, we're asking the wrong question. Because these guys were not the best and the brightest. They weren't, they didn't go to Ivy League schools. They didn't have PhDs in religious studies. They weren't wealthy. They didn't have lots to offer. But these are the dudes that Jesus chooses to build his kingdom upon. But it's not just these guys. The, right after listing these 11 men, which by the way, there's 11, not 12, because Judas Iscariot is gone by this point. After listing these 11 men, it says um, in verse 14, they were all continually united in prayer along with the women including Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Who are the women? It seems like it's a, a definable group of the women, and like Luke would think that Theophilus that he's writing to would know exactly who he's talking about. And I think Theophilus did. Because when you go back and you read the Gospels, the material that Theophilus would have known, there was a group of women who were following Jesus, people like Mary Magdalene, who was possessed by seven evil spirits, seven demons, and Jesus had set her free. People like Susanna, who was married to Herod's steward, a group of women who financially supported Jesus because Jesus had given up his trade. He was a craftsman, but then he quit doing that, quit supporting himself, and began traveling around Israel preaching the kingdom of God. The Bible says that there were a group of women who began to follow Jesus and they had means and they're supporting him. The group of women probably also included Salome, who was a witness both to the crucifixion and to the resurrection of Jesus, according to the gospel records. And then, of course, verse 14 says Mary, the mother of Jesus, she's been there from the beginning. When by the power of the Holy Spirit, she conceived the Messiah as a virgin. She's been there longer than any of them. She's seen the highs and the lows. She saw the horror of Good Friday when her son was murdered. And she saw the the beauty of Easter. And now Mary, with this group of women and these 11 disciples... And about 120 people is gathered in this upper room because Jesus has gone back to heaven and he said the Holy Spirit's coming in a few days, but for right now, we're in that few day gap. We're trying to figure out what do we do right now. And then in verse 15, Peter mentions the elephant in the room. There are not 12 apostles anymore. There's only 11. And he recounts this story of how Judas Iscariot has betrayed Jesus, led the soldiers right toward Jesus in the garden, and then out of remorse and regret, Judas Iscariot has gone and committed suicide. He's hung himself in this field of blood. It's not that Judas repented of his sins. The, the Bible doesn't seem to indicate that he repented, but he had a, a regret, a remorse, which is different from repentance. When you, when you do something wrong 
and you have no intention to change, you have regret sometimes, you have remorse, usually about the consequences to yourself or to others. But the Bible says repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of actions. I am convinced that if Judas Iscariot had come back to Jesus on Easter morning, Jesus would have welcomed him into the family. Because the Bible teaches us that God's mercy and God's grace are never ending. But Judas didn't come back. He didn't come back. He went and hung himself. So Peter said, this was all according to the plan of God. And he quotes from various Bible passages. He quotes from Psalm uh, 69 and Psalm 109. And he says that this was part of the plan of God. In verse 16, he says, it was necessary that the scripture be fulfilled, that the Holy Spirit through the mouth of David foretold about Judas. You see, Jesus wasn't some uh, victim in some uh, anti-Messiah plot. It wasn't that the Romans and the Jewish leaders victimized Jesus. This was the divine plan of the ages unfolding before time itself had begun. This was what had been predicted through the mouth of David by the Holy Spirit in Psalms, where he had said that someone would betray Jesus and then someone would take his place. You see, God is orchestrating events. He orchestrated the events of the betrayal and the crucifixion and the resurrection of his own son. And he's still orchestrating events in our lives today. This provides comfort and encouragement to us. We're entering a new year. And sometimes we can associate uh, various aspects of fate with these new years. But the Bible teaches us that we don't have to worry about a dragon or a rat or a rabbit or any of the different signs of the zodiac because every year is the year of King Jesus. Every year is the year of the Lord. Peter looked at his brothers and he said, this is exactly what was supposed to happen because the Holy Spirit decreed that it would happen. So we're not at the mercy of blind fate, but we're trusting in the sovereignty of our Lord, King Jesus. But because Judas is dead, Peter said we need a replacement. We need somebody to take his place so that there can be 12 of us. Now you might think, why? Why does it matter that there's 12 apostles? The number was symbolic because there were 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, you might remember that Jacob had these certain number of sons. It turned into the 12 tribes of Israel and all of Israel was structured around these 12 tribes. And when Jesus comes, he very intentionally picks 12 men. Now, there are, there are lots of other people following him. There are this group of women. There's this 120. At one point, there's like 72 disciples. And then another time, there's like 500. But there's always a subset from within that group of 12. And the number 12 is intentional because what Jesus is doing is sending a message that he is finishing the story of Israel, that he is the true Israelite. He is qualified to be the king of Israel, and he's gathering these men as representative leaders of the 12 tribes. Not that they actually hail from each of the 12 tribes, but it's, it's the symbolism of the number that matters. And so Peter says, look, we got to get back to 12. We need, we need 12 guys uh, because we're trying to demonstrate that Jesus is the king of Israel, and so we want a 12th guy. That's where you see these last few names pop up in the text. Uh, Peter says in verse 21, Therefore, from among the men who have accompanied us during the whole time, the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day he was taken up from us. From among these, it is necessary that one become a witness with us of his resurrection. Somebody who has been there for three plus years, who has seen all the miracles that Jesus did, who was there at the beginning with John and who most importantly saw the resurrection, saw Jesus alive after he was dead. Peter said, this, this is what matters. We need a witness 
to the resurrection, some who, someone who will join us in testifying that Jesus is alive. So they had these two guys that they thought fit that profile. Uh, one of them is listed here with three different names, Joseph, Barsabbas, also Justice. And then the other guy is Matthias. And they prayed. In verse 24, you, Lord, know everyone's hearts. Show which of these two you have chosen to take the place in this apostolic ministry that Judas left to go where he belongs. And they cast lots for him. It was the ancient, ancient equivalent of rolling dice. Now, the dice fell, as it were, on Matthias. And Matthias is chosen to take Judas's place in the apostles. Um, interestingly, we don't know anything about Matthias. Other than that, he was a witness of the resurrection. We don't know anything about the other guy who, who lost the election, as it were. Uh, I feel bad for him. Uh, but we don't know anything about him either, other than the fact that he knew Jesus. He was a witness to the resurrection. This might trigger a question in your mind. Why don't we roll the dice, literally, when trying to decide what we should do as a church? We voted on elders last week. Why didn't we just like set up a table in the lobby and get some dice and blow on them and roll it and see what happens? Why didn't we do that? They cast lots in Acts chapter 1, so why do we not do that? Especially when the whole point of this series is called Blueprint, right? We're trying to figure out how to follow the pattern of the book of Acts. And I think that word pattern is really, really important because one of the things that the book of Acts does is it establishes repeating patterns where the same thing happens over and over and over and over again. And when you see that repeating pattern in the book of Acts, when you see the same thing happening in the church in Jerusalem that happens in the church at Antioch, that happens in the church at Philippi, you're like, okay, the Holy Spirit is telling us to sit up and pay attention and we're supposed to imitate this practice in our church. This is the blueprint. But when something is a one-off event in this history book of the early church and it never happens again, I think we would be wise to be cautious and say, maybe this is not a pattern. It happens once, they never do it again, they never replicate this practice in any other churches, maybe just maybe this is not part of our blueprints. Maybe this part of the text is simply descriptive. It's telling us what happened rather than what we ought to do especially given the unique moment in history in which they live. This is the only church that ever existed in a gap of a few days between the departure of Jesus and the arrival of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit guides us as a church, and the way he does that primarily is through the word of God and through the testimony of the brothers and sisters. They didn't have that. The Holy Spirit hadn't come yet. They were on their own in this upper room trying to figure it out. And so they pray, Lord, we're about to cast lots. Please, would you let the lot land on the person that you have chosen? And I think God probably was merciful and did select the one that he chose. So some people, some people dispute that and say, well, maybe, maybe the whole thing was wrong. Like, and they, Christians shouldn't have even done this. I think it was okay to do what they did, but it's not a practice that I or Pastor Ken or the elders will be leading us to employ as a church because we think that this was a unique moment in the history of the church. This is not a pattern for us to follow, but this is how they got there. You see, the Holy Spirit, through whatever means necessary, was assembling a diverse team of misfits a band of brothers and sisters who didn't belong a group of people who who didn't need to be together and in fact when you think about matthew the tax collector and simon the zealot these were the kinds of folks that didn't even like each other and god said fine i'll make you a family and i'll give you a mission that's going to change the world so you're gonna have to figure out how to work together This diverse team of misfits is waiting on the Holy Spirit's arrival because Jesus has said it's in just a few days. And so they're waiting for that just a few days. And when that happens, they know that they will be immersed 
in the life of the Holy Spirit, and they will be launched into his mission. And until then, they're waiting. In the church of Jesus Christ, we all have a role to play. Some of us suffer from imposter syndrome. We feel like we don't belong because of our past, because of our sinful struggles or our lack of talents. Some of us suffer from imposter syndrome because like Thomas, we have doubts. Like Thomas, there are days that we believe less than we did the day before. And so we think, I don't know if I belong in this community of saints. And that pretty much describes the people who made up this first church, gathered in the upper room, waiting for the Holy Spirit to fall. God didn't pick the people who were spiritual giants and never doubted God. God didn't pick the highly educated and super talented. He assembled a band of misfits. And then he handed them a blueprint. And that's still what he does today. In every generation, in every church, each of us has a role to play in executing the mission of God's church. Every blueprint, blueprint, whether for the Space Needle or for CEC, needs a team of people who will say, yes, I'm in. I'll be more than a spectator. I'll roll up my sleeves and I'll join this team. Because today, Jesus is still inviting people into the upper room. He's still inviting people into his family. He's still inviting people to join his team and implement his ancient blueprint. The only question is whether or not we will say yes to his call. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray that your word would that your word would transform us that your word would inspire us, that your word would challenge us, that we would be people who are not just hearers of the word, but doers of the word. And as we come to the Lord's table and remember your sacrifice, I pray that we would be people who are willing to follow you anywhere. We love you, Lord. Amen. So on the first Sunday of every month, we observe uh, the Lord's table together. And uh, we also call it communion. And communion is a great word for it because it is something that is inherently communal. We enter into communion with God when we remember the death, burial, and resurrection of the Son of God. But we also enter into communion with one another because this is not something that you do on your own at your house. This is not something that you do with some friends on vacation. This is something you do with God's people as you gather together in covenant community. The Apostle Paul said, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Um, this is a an in-house meal, meaning it's for the family of Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you're not sure that you're a Christian, you're not sure that Jesus is your Lord, then I would encourage you not to partake. It's not the same thing as saying, were you baptized? I'm not asking if you've been baptized. I'm asking if you're a Christian. If you are a Christian, if you are ready to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes, as Paul says, I would invite you in a few moments 
to come and receive the elements. The bread symbolizes the body of Jesus broken for us on the cross. The fruit of the vine symbolizes the spilt blood of Jesus poured out on the cross. And we do this together, time after time after time, because we are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. So as Kevin is playing along, I'm going to invite you to come and to receive the elements, to receive the bread and the wine. Don't take them on your own. Wait and let's take them together as one family. And again, maybe even if this is your first time taking communion, if you are ready to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes, I invite you to come and receive the body and blood of Jesus when you are ready. bread is not actually the body of Jesus, but it symbolizes for us his body broken for us. Take and eat. In the same way, the grape juice symbolizes for us the blood of Christ. Take and drink. Immediately after the Last Supper, in the upper room, the disciples sang a song together. I don't know what song they sang, so we can't copy them, but we can sing a song. So let's stand together and let's celebrate what God has done let's, by singing.
Now to him who is able to protect you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory without blemish and with great joy, to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And that concludes our service this morning. And you may be dismissed after a moment of silent meditation. <laughs>